I was looking at a report that was put out by Edified, their mystery shopper report. Yep. And the experience that students are having in terms of the, their inquiries and being followed up is extremely variable across major destinations, UK, Canada, Australia, NZ, to the extent that the average mark, the average score out of 100 for that experience was in the low 50s. Oof, which is not good, is it? Oh, I mean, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. obviously, you've got some unis that are scoring up close to 80 or even a little bit above 80. Mm. The worst in the world scored nine, <laughs> nine out of 100. Into, I mean, that's brutal, right? G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Rob Malicki, one of the co-hosts of the show. Global Horizons is Australia's international education podcast where in each episode, we're focusing on the stories that make our industry just so great to work in. Sometimes those stories will be industry news and current affairs, and other times we're going to dive into the personal careers and travel stories of a guest who joins us on the show. Today, I'm joined by Dirk Mulder, the editor of The Koala News, which is Australia's dedicated international education news website, for an analysis of the top stories touching our industry right now. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your co-host today, Rob Malicki. I'm coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And I'm Dirk Mulder, our founder of the Koala News, coming to you from Perth, Western Australia. Now, Rob, it's been a big week. None, probably no bigger week in Australian international education than, than the week of AIEC, the Australian International Education Conference. You were fortunate enough to, to be there for the week. Unfortunately, I wasn't. I had a prior engagement. How was it? Was it to live up to your expectations? It was a big week, Dirk. And just like you've said, it's always a big week. This year in lovely Adelaide, 1,700 odd participants. And to be honest, it was probably the, not to say that it's never been well organized before, but it's definitely the like best, most polished conference that I've been to in, in, in a number of years. From the exhibition hall right through to the sessions. I love how Josephine from IDP just kind of keeps leveling that conference up. And she's great, isn't she? She's amazing. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. So she's been on the ground now, I think for close to a decade with the conference and just keeps on delivering So some things a little, you know, from the ice cream truck in the conference hall through to the the variety of sessions on offer, it just kind of keeps moving forward. And I think that's what keeps bringing people back. So a couple of interesting things, obviously, as we talked about in our first news episode a couple of weeks ago, all of those government changes, and I know we're going to get onto those in just a moment, but a lot of conversations around the hall going on, and I'd almost call them concerns about how some of those changes are going to be implemented. Broadly speaking, everyone I was chatting to about it thinks that the announcements are really good ideas, long overdue in many cases, but are very curious about how some of these things are going to be implemented, Dirk, as as you know well. Some of the systems that international educators rely on, like (coughs) PRISMs, maybe aren't ready yet or a long way from being ready to accommodate some of these changes. Uh, I spoke to a number of admissions and compliance people who are just saying, Great idea, but how are we actually going to deliver on this? And that's probably been the case for quite a while, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I, you know, if I think back to the, I'm just going to sound like an old person now, but to the 20 odd years that I've been in national ed and the, you know, reviews like the night review and, and, and so on and so forth, I think the government's got a track record of, of having intent to do better. But as the rubber hits the road, there's always that that one or two things that aren't really either aren't in scope or uh, are kind of afterthoughts that, that can really affect the way that the entire system is rolled out. So you're absolutely right. I think we, you're right. We will get onto one of those points a little bit later because there's been some interesting things come out on one of those one of those points this week. So we'll, we'll get onto that in a sec. Some of the other things that I picked up from from AIEC, uh, I'm a learning abroad specialist as as my background, and what we've seen is a, a very rapid rebound in outbound learning abroad numbers. So for those who aren't familiar with it, learning abroad is considered study abroad and exchange, outbound programming, short-term programs, internships, all those things, not just bringing in students on your inbound study abroad experiences, but also sending students out. Learning abroad has exploded back into into fashion, if you like, with students, the borders reopening. And the pressure seems to be on with, with universities getting those programs back operational. We're certainly seeing that some of the teams that were completely dismantled during the the pandemic are really under the pump now to try and answer this demand which makes sense it's been pent up for a number of years and we're, we're seeing the 
the impact of that now on on teams across the board makes complete sense it, that actually i mean it's really interesting you say that because that compounds or, it, or i guess it, it comes in over the top of some of the reports that have been released lately and i know cis australia through uh, brad doherty's group released a report just recently which said all of those things if they are bouncing back numbers are growing and staff are looking at growing as well staff and officers so so it's a really really good sign for australian students going abroad as well as short-term students coming into australia it's, it's fantastic Matches, if you like, the, the, the recovery of inbound international numbers as well. It, it makes sense. And to me, one of the interesting things for universities is going to be how they manage that element of the student experience because it's a competitive landscape out there trying to recruit students both domestically and internationally. And learning abroad is one of those elements that universities can throw into the mix that is extremely appealing to a group of students, the ability to add an international study experience, which employers love onto a resume. So I really feel that this is an area that's going to, to come rushing up really quickly to quite a few universities. And suddenly they're going to realize that they're behind the eight ball on getting their learning abroad teams back up and operational. And and there may be other sort of consequences for that going forward. Absolutely. I mean, I think you, know, it, you, you nail it from the point of view where you're going with this is absolutely right. A broad experiences will come into that student decision making and then what will be really interesting will be the dynamics of the relationships the bilateral relationships that Australian universities have with universities offshore so if if you're coming to Australia and you're wanting to do six months somewhere wow wouldn't it be an amazing opportunity to go do six months at Harvard or MIT or Cal Poly or Imperial College London as opposed to and no offense to any of these institutions if they exist you know the University of Northwest South Dakota or or something similar so having that that value proposition within your abroad program I think is going to be really really unique one of the most innovative sessions that I went to was in learning abroad space, but sort of touches on what you were just saying around students being able to have multiple experiences or get get abroad for integrated experiences. And Simon Davis Burrows and a colleague, Neil Weston from the University of Portsmouth, put forward what honestly is the best dual degree program design that I've seen. Extremely successful. We're talking 100 plus students a year on an exchange basis undertaking that dual degree program between the two institutions and growing rapidly. And I just thought to myself sitting in that session, this is really one of those things that is going to define universities in the next 30 years. Why, why go to uni when you can study online, you can consume from your bedroom? Well, it's all that extra stuff outside the classroom that I think is going to count for more. And this innovative dual degree program that, that Portsmouth and Edith Cowan have come up with, it was just phenomenal. It absolutely blew me away. Doesn't that go to the heart, though, of what a university experience is all about? It's about differentiation, right? How do I differentiate myself in a marketplace and going to university, having those experiences started off, you know, way back in the day, uh, you know, as you, you might go to the local one, then you might travel 50 k's away to be differentiated. And then you might travel to another country to be differentiated. Now we're going to the other side of the world. And now we're looking at a complex layer of differentiations within that. So completely agree, Rob. And on that differentiation, that made me think about segmentation. Number of sessions on AI, where AI is going and how that's going to impact the industry. A little bit on, on the teaching and learning side, but very much on the marketing recruitment side of things. Fascinating sessions from IDP and others. And I feel like where there was like a handful of sessions this year on the agenda, I think next year that's going to be a, a huge topic. I really feel that the ability to segment and personalize, to analyze your data and to provide a more detailed experience is is going to become the game. Just earlier before we, we, took, we, we got online here, Dirk, I was looking at a report that was put out by Edified, their mystery shopper report. Yep. And the experience that students are having in terms of the, their inquiries and being followed up is extremely variable across major destinations, UK, Canada, Australia, NZ, to the extent that the average mark, the average score out of 100 for that experience was in the low 50s. Oof, which it's not good, is it? Oh, I mean, yeah, right. I mean, yeah. obviously, you've got some unis that are scoring up close to eighty or even a little bit above eighty. Mm. The worst in the world scored nine, <laughs> nine <laughs> out of a hundred. Into, Ouch. I mean, that's brutal, right? But fifty oh. as a user experience, uh, I think, shows just how important this AI arms race is going to be mm. for institutions to level up their game with that segmentation and that personalization, which we know is so important. Agreed. Agreed 100%. 
So along with that, the IEAA, International Education of Australia, always has its AGM. And what I took away from that was the, the association's in fantastic shape. They, they smashed all of their um, financial targets for the year in a good way, I should say. And, and full credit to the association, which, which continues to go from, from strength to strength. They also had the announcement of the uh, election. So we've got a few new board members. Rishan Shekhar from UniSA, very well-known figure. Yana Pereira really? as well, much loved and energetic person in our industry. And then Brett Lovegrove, who, who is so deeply experienced currently at UQ, has, has also joined the board. And Bromman Barch, Director of Global Engagement at ACU, has been re-elected as Treasurer, and I think that's a, a very good thing. I think she's done a great job in that in that role. Oh, and, and then last but not least, I have to give a special shout-out, Dirk, and, and this might make you laugh, to Alex Vaninsky. Alex has been around a long time. People know him well. One of the best-dressed <laughs> humans in Australia. <laughs> he sure is. He sure is. He's a very, a very, very smartly dressed man. And he completely over-delivered on, on the costume, on his costume for conference dinner night, his gold mirror ball moped helmet for the Technicolor theme uh, of, of the conference dinner was utterly outstanding. <laughs> Rob, but Alex isn't the only one who who obviously was dressed up on the night. So I've seen a few photos floating around the internet of you. And I, I saw a post actually of yours just recently. And I actually, it took me, you being able to talk about being someone who's somewhat shy and using the AIC reception or the, or the dinner as a vehicle to try and get out there a little bit more. I think the word body paint comes to mind. Tell us, a, tell, us a, tell us a little bit more about that. I am a little bit of an introvert, which people might find find amusing. And I always used to end up at that conference dinner event up in the back corner, you know, hiding myself away, looking forlornly at the dance floor, wishing I could be out there and have the confidence to do that. And one year I, I had this moment where I saw the conference theme and I think it was like beyond the cosmos or something like that. And I just thought, what the heck, I'm going to dress up. And I, I, I put on this costume. I, I, I rented a costume as a Jedi warrior. I was walking into the conference dinner and I had the hood over my head like you, you there was no way you could tell who I was and as I walked past Heidi Piper of all people first profile episode on Global Horizons you can check that out or drop it in the show notes Heidi says Rob Rob Malicki and to this day I have no idea how she knew it was me but it actually changed something for me it suddenly made me realize that when you actually dress up and go to one of those events people come to you instead of you having to go to them. And as a bit of an introvert, it just changes the game. So I had so many great conversations at that conference dinner, some of which has led to work, all because I, I, I pushed myself out of my comfort zone getting ready for it. Once you're there, you forget that you're dressed up and it's great fun. So I'd highly recommend people, if, you know, if you're a little bit uncomfortable being at those events, actually go as fancy dress. You'd be amazed what it does for your confidence. Highly recommended. Mate, as I said, it really resonated with me because I am, I probably am one of those guys who sits back a little bit and allows other people to occupy the space on the dance floor. I, it probably takes me back to to junior high school and those blue light discos that I could never quite get myself out there for. So uh, full marks to you, I say. Good on you. Encourage people to come to you, you know, so you don't have to go to them. It's, it's just a flip of psychology. It's great. And so that was this year's AIEC. A lot of fun as usual. Great characters, great, great conversations. Next year's conference theme is the human element. And that got me really excited because to me, the human element is all around storytelling. Storytelling is one of my big things that I'm really passionate about. So I really can't wait to see how AIEC 2024 shapes up. So that was AIEC, but there's been lots else going on Dirk, what's been going on from your point of view? There sure has. To begin with, I mean, we, I think we covered a little bit last week and, and, you know, the government put out a flurry of announcements a couple of weeks back. And one particular one is, has been picked up by a few people and, and really pushed. And it's around the, 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 the flow on from the Nixon review and around one of the, I guess, the changes that the government's foreshadowing around preventing cross ownership of businesses between education providers and education agents. And I think, you know, every every person out there probably says, well, this is a good thing, right? Because what we want to try and do is break down, you know, these kind of these pipelines that are starting to exist where agents offshore will put them in their own colleges or they'll put them somewhere else and then track them back into their own colleges. You know, we certainly want to break that. But one of the things that come to light this week is actually, well, what does that mean for some of the, the bigger players in the market? And, and, you know, namely, I guess, is, is IDP right at the front of it. 
IDP has, and don't quote me on this, but a significant, I'll say a significant share so nobody can uh, tell me that I'm wrong, a significant share by Australian universities. So firstly, I guess Ravi Lokan Singh from, from Global Reach in India um, mooted this one last week and, and then Claire Field followed up with a story yesterday about it. And it's a really, really good point. So, you know, again, we go back to that conversation about some of these changes are really good in terms of uh, outlook and in terms of wanting to change models that will support students. The implementation, though, and when we come back to implementation, they could have really consequential effects on, on, on how this will roll out. So it's a really, really good point. And I think there's a couple of other companies that are in a similar situation, but the obvious one's IDP and Australian universities. Will it mean that universities will have to divest their share of IDP? I don't know. Will there be exceptions made? Who knows? But watch this space. But it's a really, a really interesting point that's been made. Definitely devil will be in the detail. And moving on from, from that, AI is a topic that you've been thinking about this week. Seems to be showing up in student choice and application data. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the presentations given by IDP, and I think it's IDP Connect who did the did the research was around emerging futures. AI is really becoming part of the decision making process for inst- uh, for for students, but not just that. Actually, being actively involved in the application process. So I guess up until this point, we've probably always thought that, you know, ChatGPT would end up figuring somewhat, but the stats are amazing. I mean, 45% of students indicated they would use AI to help them decide which institution to study at, while 47% were open to using it to decide which course to study. So we're almost talking about one in two students that's been surveyed, either using or contemplating using AI to, to help them engage. So it says something really, really interesting. So going back probably three weeks, I think it was QS that's actually built a plug into the paid version of ChatGPT. So maybe they're, they're you know, ahead of the curve in terms of seeing some of this data coming through and saying, where do we need to position ourselves as a recruitment support organisation to, 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 get, to get the right messages into, the, into these students' essentially computer screens, which, they, which they're going to pull out. Interestingly enough, though, when when moving beyond that, AI was actually used to help write applications. Now, this is the bit that I think we we need to start being a little bit concerned about, or maybe not concerned about, but certainly take on notice and and, and start thinking about this in a different way. Of the global cohort that was surveyed, 39% said uh, yes, and students from China were the most inclined to use AI, with 73% indicating that they may have used ChatGPT to help their university application. So, yeah, interesting data, really some some high numbers there and a lot higher than probably what I would have imagined. But I think, you know, take note, universities and, and private colleges and, and TAFEs and English colleges because people are out there on, on AI and, and they, might, they may not be producing a lot of this data themselves. And maybe it's not just the institutions that need to be on notes, but maybe the agents as well. Obviously, the big players are probably onto this already and fairly secure in their knowledge of where things are going and have their own plans. But the smaller players there, I think, could could really cop some damage very fast from this because if you can then go to a tool and it helps you to make your subject selections or make you know, choose your institution, can even then start to provide guidance through the complexity of that visa process, the question starts to be, well, why am I actually interacting with an agency. I mean, at this stage, I think we still preference humans over <laughs> over bots, but maybe for how much longer? Convenience trumps all, don't you think? It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I just, I, you know what? I remember. I'm gonna, I'm gonna diverge for a second. I remember when, when my mum and dad. I was pestering my mum and dad for a video player, and they said, "Why do you need a video player?" And now I'm their age, and I've got kids my, of the age that I was, and we're now talking about AI, and I'm starting to feel a little bit old. It's incredible. Who, who knows what the future will bring and who knows what, you know, the future for our children will bring, you know, in, in 20 years' time. But certainly AI is going to play a big, a big role in it. Absolutely. And some announcements from the from AIC about the IEAA Excellence Awards came out as well. Yeah, what a wonderful time of the year, right? This is really, to me, the, the pinnacle of the year when you get to celebrate your colleagues and, and the hard work that you've seen them put in for such a long time. So shall we run down the list and maybe just we'll pick them off one by one? But certainly to start with, the distinguished contribution to international education was shared by Alsa Lamont and Eliza Chu. And again, two formidable people within international education for a very long time. So congratulations to both of those. Again, their contributions are second to none and and, and thoroughly deserved winners. Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. Deb Langton, I used to work for Deb back in my Macquarie days, and she has been awarded excellence in leadership in international ed. And same thing, I mean, over over decades, Deb has been a fearless leader in international education. I love working for Deb, just a straight shooter, hard worker, great sense of humour. Great, great sense of humour. She's she's always someone that I've very much respected as, as being around the AUIDF table too. So you, again, like you say, straight shooter and doesn't mind putting what's best in front of what might be considered, you know, maybe politically awkward. Shall we say? You know, I guess the area that we're talking about now in the media, so excellence in, in professional commentary related to international education. I'm so happy with this one. Claire Field was the recipient of that. I, for the longest time, have kind of stood back and, and admired Claire from afar. We were co-writers at, at Campus Morning Mail, and we only really got started to talk after Stephen Matchett pulled the pin on Campus Morning Mail, and, and we started to think about what's next. So we've become, I would say, really close colleagues and, and, and I would say friends, you know, literally over the last four or five months. But I'm so chuffed for her because she's been doing a lot of work you know, right across different medias as well. So she obviously writes a lot, but she does her podcast as well. And yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly deserved winner. So congratulations to Claire. A couple of other ones here. I'll skip through a couple of these kind of quickly. Innovation in International Education, hashtag the social source. The Tony Adams Rising Star Award to Varsha Devi Balakrishnan with commendation to Dev Desai, who I, who I know Personally, he's a, he's a really good guy. And Tony Adams, of course, was a an absolute legend in international education. So great to see his name still featuring on the awards. And then outgrade, Outstanding Postgraduate Thesis. He's a name that's very well known, Dirk. Absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Joanne Barker. Joanne was the director at, at the University of Adelaide for what I feel is the longest time. And I certainly, I, I count Joe as, as a really close friend. So just, again, really super chuffed to see her up on stage. It's it's really, really good. There's also a, a commendation to Minthi Nock Kwak. And again, congratulations to Minthi. And then no surprises actually on the life membership category to see Stephen Connolly's name. He's a very well known and very experienced campaigner here in international education, wouldn't you say, Dirk? Oh, absolutely. Stephen, as I guess one of my early on mentors, I remember going into you know one of my first IAA meetings and Stephen was in there and Stephen's got a sort of, sort of gravitas around him, really. He's been there for a long time. He's you know not, not scared to say, again, what might be unpopular and is, has been a true leader for a very long time. He was president of the IAA early on and played an integral role role in getting the IA secretariat up and going and, and based out of institutions that he may have been at, namely RMIT and Swinburne, I believe. So yeah, Stephen's had a had a you know a fantastic history in, in in international education and of course that continues to today. So again, another another really worthy recipient. The award for best practice in international education went to the New South Wales Job Connect for International Students Study New South Wales and Seek and as a high commendation for advancing STEM education in Papua New Guinea, which went to QUT. This last one's a, a very special award, wouldn't you say, Dirk? It sure is. You know, uh, Tracy McCabe, I, I'm going to try not to get emotional here. I've actually got a photo of Tracy just above my computer here from her, her farewell service. Tracy meant a lot to me. She was a really, really close mentor when I first became a director and just a just such a solid Solid lady. I'm fortunate that I've been on the, the the committee for awarding the Tracy McCabe Fellowship in the past. And yeah, it's just, it thrills me to think that her name lives on the way that it has. And you know, congratulations to the AUIDF, which has did such a great job in the early days and continues to do so at, at recognising future leaders. And, and the winner this year is Maria Reutemann. So congratulations to Maria. It's, yeah, it's, it's just wonderful to see that that legacy continues. Absolutely. Moving on, on to India. And there's been mm. some developments there. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, I mean, India, of course, are coming out of out of COVID. There's a massive spotlight on, on India. India's growth to Australia has been tremendous, as it has been to Canada. And ARI, which obviously is the the agent network and representative uh, association of agents in India, I guess what I'd say is a fairly strong lobbying voice in terms of what the agent network's thinking, feeling, and doing. I say that because they actually put together a survey. They commissioned Acumen, which is part of the CNM S4 group to conduct a survey. So there were 66 agents surveyed. Those those were from India, 26 agents from Nepal, and 10 in-country university representatives. The interesting point out of this one is around sub-agents. So nearly 66% of agents surveyed, and that's so we're going to think these are probably area members that were surveyed, stated that they would work with other agents. That is, that was through sub-agents seeking access to education providers with whom they did not already have an agreement. So there's a system, I guess, that, that works. If somebody works walks through your door in, in India and says, I want to go to the University of Tasmania 
and you as, a, as an education agent don't have an agreement with the University of Tasmania, you can walk down the road and shake someone's hand who does and, and be able to essentially split a commission or, or do something in a business way to ensure that this student can get to the University of Tasmania and a, and a commission is obtained. So typically that's the way that sub-agent networks have worked. What's been really interesting has been Aries' view on, on agent aggregators. While we take that initial structure, I guess, which is, you know, worked for a very, or I shouldn't say worked, which has existed for a very long time, in recent years we've had t- essentially tech companies come along and say to, to these agents that don't have agreements with certain institutions, hey, work with us and we'll be able to get, well, you can send your students through us to an institution. So long as they're quality verified and there's there's quality assurance that takes place, no one's a loser, right? This is good. The student who, who wants to actually go to a certain institution has access to it. Not so, according to ARI. Continually, the ARI executive have been given feedback that, that companies like this have had their marketing persons everywhere. And I, I'm kind of quoting here, everywhere, trying to appoint their sub-agents. Travel agents, insurance brokers, training academies, etc., are being approached to become their sub-agents. Most don't even have proper knowledge of education system or protocols. Now, I'm sure agent aggregators in the market, I won't name any because I, I won't put any on the spot, but I'm sure that the people who exist in this space say that that's untrue and that there is training that goes on that and you know, for full and for full transparency, I actually assisted the GSP early on in the days in terms of getting in terms of being introduced to institutions. So I am familiar with the process, and I think those aggregators who base their work on quality are in a good place. But I guess the question now becomes: Is are there are there tech companies, are there aggregators out there who aren't basing their business model on quality? And if they're not basing their business model on quality, then they've probably got some answers, uh, some some questions to answer. Definitely. What else is coming up? Oh, look, probably the, the last one on my list is, uh, I want to say China more broadly. And I say the, I, I've said this in a few different uh, forums, but if we think about um, where we're at as a country in terms of inbound students, most of the dialogue in the news has been around India. Uh, India, for, for lots of different reasons, as, as, as have been noted, you know, there's foreign education bills going in India, India students coming to Australia, people who are jumping, jumping things. But the one that I think we need to start paying more attention to is China. So there's an event coming up uh, next week, uh, the 24th of October at the Sydney Town Hall, and it's the Australia-China Education Tourism Symposium, and it's hosted by the Australian China Business Council. In the past, this has always been a really good forum, and if I if I lived in Sydney and, and I was able to attend it more, more easily, I think I would be there with bells on. But the reason being, China for the first time, I think, Grew so they grew. I want to say six percent in the in the last series of numbers that came out from EDI. So there were seven hundred and ten thousand international students on student visas. And the top five countries accounted for fifty five percent of international students. China at twenty one percent, India at seventeen percent, Nepal at eight, Colombia at five, and the Philippines at four. The big one is that China grew, and and if we think about the bilateral relationship that's going on at the moment between Australia and China, and the China, the Australian journalist has just been released out of from out of incarceration in China. Yep, I think the Australia-China relationship is getting back on track, and that will only do well to serve increased international students from China. And we can start to see that happen already. Um, if you look at visa grants uh, between January and June uh, of this year. Um, they've grown significantly. So they're up to 45,712, uh, which is 121% up against 2019. Um, that's 2019 prior to COVID. We're not talking about COVID here. We're, we're, up, we're up massively. Yeah. It's a very, very good lead indicator to show that China's coming back. And I think that we need to start paying more attention to Chinese students and, and our relationships with China. Very interesting. The first thing that made me think about was this kind of rhetoric that we're sort of seeing around cost of living and pressures in the cities and how, unfortunately, that deem of international students stealing our accommodation, stealing our jobs, seems to be sneaking back into elements of the media. And thinking about stories and storytelling, I think Australian International Ed still has a lot of work to do in that in that regard to make sure that we're continuing to talk the good story about the amazing impact that international students have on our institutions and, and on our country in general. Matt, I agree completely. Well, Dirk, always lovely to chat. 
And once again, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to stay up to date with all of the latest news, the koala news or one word dot com is the place to be. Always appreciate your hard work, Dirk, keeping us up to date with all the international education news relevant to Australia. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks time on Global Horizons. See you later, Dirk. Look forward to it, Rob, and look forward to hearing about what what outfit you might have planned for next AOC. <laughs> see you next time, mate. <laughs> see ya. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com.au.